So this is the uh, last presentation under uh, population uh, interactions. And uh, we have come to the uh, uh, last um, like um, population interaction we were dealing with. It is a negative interspecific population interaction. And in this presentation, we will be dealing with the parasitism, um, the different kinds of parasitism or the parasitic adaptations, etc. So we can see what is uh, parasitism. Uh, parasitism is a kind of negative interaction that is an antagonistic interaction between two species where one individual is benefited and the other is harmed. And the one which is benefited is referred as the parasite and the one which is uh, actually harmed it is a host. Okay. Um, the species on which the parasite depends, it is referred as a host. So, a parasite is an, any organism which lives on or in the body of host. It may derive its food, shelter at the expense of the host. Uh, Cameroon it, uh, defined a parasite as an organism which is dependent for some essential metabolic factors on other organism which is always larger than itself. Okay, I hope it is clear. That is, the uh, interaction between a parasite and a host is for metabolic factors, that is for food. And always the uh, host is larger than the parasite. Fine. Now, uh, so when we um, like compare predator-host uh, with the parasite-host relation, we can see that Parasite is generally smaller than the host, unlike predator, usually it is larger than the host. Um, though a parasite exploits the resources uh, from the host, it never kills it. It does not kill the host. The reason is for the survival of a parasite, the, uh, it is a must that the uh, host should survive. And uh, uh, the death of a host usually occur due to some secondary effects maybe due to the infection by the parasite but it is not directly killing the host so parasite uh, parasitism differs from predation in which uh, uh, the predator kills the prey but the parasite never kill, directly kills the prey now there is that predator is always larger than the host while parasite is always smaller than the host uh, parasites they may they may be found throughout the animal kingdom um, most of the parasites, uh, we can see they are protozoans, uh, nematodes, platyhelminthes, arthropods, etc. Uh, okay, right. Okay, we can uh, now pass on to the different kinds of parasites. There are plenty of classifications and this is the first one we are going to see. Now, uh, generally there are two types of parasites. One is... Uh, Temporary parasite and the other is uh, a permanent parasite. Temporary parasite is also referred as partial parasite. So what is what are uh, temporary parasites? Temporary parasites are those which spend only a part of their life cycle as parasites. So they are not throughout the life they are not parasites. Instead, they are parasites only during a short span of their life. So they live as free living organisms for the major part of their life. Okay. Um, there are plenty of examples. One is uh, the glochidium larva of freshwater mussel. You may have learned it under mollusk when you study that the molluscan larva is referred as a glochidium larva. So, okay, so the, uh, the sorry, the larva of the freshwater mussel uh, they attach themselves to the body of a fish, uh, and for attaching they do have uh, hook-like structures, uh, and they penetrate uh, the integument or the skin covering, and it remain buried inside for several weeks and finally when it emerges out as a young it leads an independent life so it remains as a parasite only during that particular part of the life when they are penetrating the integument of the fish and remaining there till the emergence right similarly you can see uh, when we discussed about the predators the last uh, what you call uh, group of predators which we discussed was parasitoids or the last type of predators we uh, referred was parasitoidism. This parasitoidism can even be considered as a temporary parasite. Wherein the insects uh, which take up parasitoidism, um, they are mainly free living um, forms 
they are parasitic only during a specific part of the life usually larvae the, uh, the stage it remains inside the uh, host body so the adults they are free living right so uh, that is regarding the temporary parasites so we we cited two examples one was glucidium larva um, of the freshwater mussel on the fishes Right. Second one is the parasitoids of certain insects, especially the hymenopterous insects. I suppose the first example will be a little more easier for you. So, glucidium lara of freshwater mussel on fishes, it is an example for temporary parasites. Okay, so what are permanent parasites? Permanent parasites spend their whole life as parasites, that is, they are parasites throughout their life. The permanent parasites uh, um, are can be uh, classified into uh, um, ectoparasite and endoparasite based upon their location um, with respect to the host okay when the parasites spend their life on the outer surface of the host we refer such parasites as ectoparasites or external parasites okay for example like ticks mites uh, lice flea etc now those parasites which live inside the body of the host they are termed as endoparasites endoparasites we, we, uh, we may uh, you may have uh, gone through different kind kind of endoparasites in the uh, first year of your uh, zoology class so there you may have found that um, plasmodium is an uh, endoparasite there were ascaris um, uh, helminthes is a round one hook all those are endoparasites of different organisms right now the endoparasites it can be further divided into two uh, based on where they live inside the host that is whether it is inside the cell or outside the cell so the intracellular parasites and intercellular parasites intracellular parasites they live inside the cell of the host uh, for example plasmodium right plasmodium they um, uh, are intracellular parasite you may have learned the life cycle of uh, plasmodium in your first year uh, first semester classes and there you may have seen that it can uh, it completes its life cycle passing through the rbcs and hepatocytes isn't it so they are intracellular parasites now intercellular parasites that is those which live um, outside the cell that is it can, uh, between the cells of the host right intercellular so the uh, tapeworms and all they are intercellular they are larger um, organisms and they cannot uh, like survive inside that so they remain um, outside the cell and they spend their uh, life as a parasite outside so it is known as inter intercellular parasite now the permanent parasites uh, it can be further there's another kind of division depending upon whether it lives on plants or animals okay so permanent parasites uh, that live on plants they are known as phytoparasites okay phyto p h y t o phytoparasites <coughs> sorry and those which live on animals they are known as zooparasites so we will be looking into the examples in the coming slides okay so here we can see the temporary parasite so uh, we were discussing about the glucidium larva on fishes is it so the glucidium larva it is actually the larval stage of um, the um, muscles freshwater muscles and uh, like mollusks right so here it is actually referring to the uh, glucidium larva of freshwater muscle these glucidium larva it attaches onto the integument of the fish and it remains there till it emerges out as the adult uh, what you call uh, this one the um, muscle so, uh, the individual it um, emerges out the a, a larva it emerges out as the muscles okay fine so that is regarding the temporary parasite um okay so these are the phytoparasites as we said the parasites on uh, host plants okay plants are the host for them so it is one example is the orictus rhinoceros Combanchilgi in the okay Orectus rhinoceros. The reason is uh, this adult beetle they possess a, a horn-like structure on its head, just like uh, what we see on in the case of a one-horned rhino. Okay, so that is why the name has come Orectus rhinoceros. And this rhinoceros beetle, uh, it uh, feeds on or it uh, the host is coconut palm. 
okay you can see the peculiar nature of the coconut leaves isn't it it has been cut the leaves have been cut this is this actually if we see such kind of palm leaves on uh, coconuts we can be sure that it is infested by the rhinoceros beetle okay the larva uh, egg is laid in uh, cow dung pit pits for decomposing matter and it emerges out as a larva and this larva it remains in the decomposing matter till it uh, becomes pupa and pupa emerges out as adult this adult flies onto the uh, palm okay the crown of the palm i think in the mandel it okay and then it feeds on uh, the uh, what you call delicate or the younger uh, tissues and ela ingana nammada tinginde ola virinende munbe okay ah elam aa oru nature la idine holes undakum okay appo angana holes adu feed cheyum adu feed cheyidittu endha sambhavichu elada ikkorenga cheri cheri holes undaikum ee ellanga thorakkana samayathu namukku kaanavuna oru character ana pee idile kaanana thengi olayilulla nature okay appo adu idu ee ela actually cheriya stage a irikkana samayathu thalayile aikkana samayathu aayikkum nammade ee adult rhinoceros beetle feed cheyidittathu okay so that is a phyto example of phyto parasites now regarding zoo parasites zoo parasites you can have plenty which you have already studied in your first year classes for example uh, helminths it you can have that is hook worm um, you can have tape or then uh, uh, plasmodium then plenty of examples you can cite okay here you can see the human hook worm uh, you can see the worm inside the body isn't it the figure um, actually um, in a very severe infestation this is a kind of exposure you can you may find it uh, the helminths in the um, limbs that is uh, in the legs and all so that kind of an infestation can be found okay so these are the parasites okay now it is the ectoparasites what are the ectoparasites ectoparasites are those parasites which live on the body of the host okay so it is completely external ectoparasites or external parasites we can see uh, lice flea and tick right so these are the uh, few examples of ectoparasites now endoparasites this is an endoparasite so the helminth and it is an endoparasite i hope it is clear then uh, it, it have the intracellular and intercellular parasites intracellular that is within the cell right this it remains inside so rbcs you can see uh, with plasmodium then intercellular that is it is outside the cell between the cells it may be so this is one kind of uh, intercellular parasite the helminth okay so it is another division of uh, parasites based upon the degree of parasitism okay that is uh, uh, based on the degree of parasitism parasites are classified into two uh, the facultative parasite and obligatory parasite as the term indicates facultative means uh, they need to be parasite throughout their life okay so it may be opportunistic or it, we can say that uh, th these are the parasites where Uh, they are parasitic only when there is a uh, what is opportunity for parasitic life so they can survive even otherwise okay so they can even survive free living uh, and when there is an opportunity for becoming a parasite they can become a parasite so there is that is one example of uh, that, that's one, one uh, kind of a parasite now second one is uh, the obligatory parasite so they are parasites throughout okay so they Uh, have to lead they must lead a parasitic life otherwise they will come they cannot survive so that kind of a parasite is what is referred as a obligatory parasite then then there is another category of uh, parasite it is known as hyper parasites okay uh, those parasites which are parasitic to another parasite are referred as hyper parasite that is parasites uh, parasitizing other parasites Fine. So we have a host with a parasite, and this parasite is parasitized by another one. So that kind of a tritrophic interaction is what is referred as a hyperparasitic mode. Okay. So I hope it is clear. Okay. So you can see to the examples for facultative and obligatory parasites. Now the facultative parasite, um, as we have seen, it is not a parasite. that is it need be a parasite always it can even uh, live as a free living organism 
but when there is a chance of uh, being a parasite it uh, actually adopt, uh, acts itself so he, opportunistic you can see that is facultative parasites here you can see a pea crab and it is inside a bivalve okay the shelled the um, bivalve you know uh, muscle okay so you here you can see um, it is inside the oestifera and um, pea crab that is pinotherus ostrium or pinotherus pisum pisum sativum in the la and the pea on the side okay pinotherus so uh, usually what it does is it is free living the males are completely free living and even the females only at certain occasions only they become a parasite so what, what they do is they uh, like um, usually a freeling but at times they parasitize the oysters okay and uh, what they do they move inside they get inside the oyster and they are considered as kleptoparasitic klepto means uh, that is stealing right so they feed on food entering the oyster okay that is they actually feed upon the food that was supposed to be taken by the oyster so this is stealing right uh, so in this way what happens is the oyster is not harmed directly they are not infected they are not harmed but only one thing is for a time being uh, the uh, pea crabs it remain inside steal the food and uh, uh, become a parasite for a short period of time so it doesn't cause any harm to the oysters and that is why it it is referred as a Uh, facultative parasite. It is otherwise known as opportunistic parasites as well. Okay, the next one is obligatory parasites. It is that is uh, compulsory parasites. They are parasites always. So organisms which can live only as parasites, depending exclusively upon their host, is referred as the obligatory parasites. So once, if you remove the host, the uh, parasite will die. and most of the endoparasites are obligatory parasites here you can see fasciola uh, fasciola is a uh, parasite and it completes its life cycle in two different hosts one is a snail that is a sheep and it needs the two hosts to complete its life cycle and if it doesn't get on to the host at the proper stage it cannot complete its life cycle it dies off so that is what is the a facultative and obligatory parasite referred okay so we can see what are the uh, adaptations uh, developed by parasites to lead a parasitic mode of life okay so uh, we can see that um, in most of the endoparasites specifically the endoparasites there is a reduction or complete loss of locomotory uh, digestive circulatory respiratory and nervous systems and we can also uh, uh, find um, in many of the endoparasites digestive glands and uh, specialized sense organs since they are of no use it is completely absent and this is mainly because the parasites are permanently uh, inside the host body uh, where there are uh, like uh, these kinds of structures are of, uh, not no use and uh, they have they are they have plenty of uh, nutrients available and other basic requirements are already fulfilled so they don't need any of these structures and uh, you, you can see that uh, in the case of um, um, endoparasites as well as in some of the ectoparasites they have developed adhesive organs okay for examples like hooks in the case of helminths suckers as in the case of uh, like uh, uh, leeches and all and there are many other structures which actually help them to cling on to the host body right they have well developed adhesive organs uh, in the case of endoparasites they may have to survive in those parts of the host body where they are exposed to maybe like high ph for example if uh, they are in um, the, that is uh, with regard to the parasites inside the human intestine highly alkaline medium isn't it so high ph and even in some cases they may be exposed to enzymatic action so for those kinds of situations they need a resistant and protective coverings and it is usually provided by like tegument cuticle and even for uh, resisting the actions of um, host enzymes and other chemicals they also produce anti enzymes for the endoparasites and endoparasites usually usually they also produce 
anti enzymes to uh, resist the uh, like uh, harmful uh, effect of horse enzymes fine and they also have the ability to tolerate uh, like uh, chemicals uh, ph temperature of the horse internal environment okay now when they are uh, when the endoparasites need to live inside the body of uh, the horse there is little or maybe no oxygen supply that is there is an anaerobic uh, condition so these parasites need to develop an ability for anaerobic respiration and it is seen that most of the endoparasites they do have great powers of an uh, anaerobic like anaerobic respiration and this helps the parasite to live in the absence of oxygen or uh, when there is very uh, little oxygen present okay now uh, when the uh, organisms are living inside the horse body uh, the uh, parasite um, uh, may have to uh, for the survival of the species they may have to stick, uh, switch on to hermaphroditism because it may be uh, difficult to find the uh, other member uh, in the um, small environment so hermaphroditism is a uh, what you call uh, rule to render sexual reproduction easy okay and similarly uh, they have high fecundity that is in a single uh, reproducing uh, cycle they may produce a huge number of uh, younger ones uh, because uh, among these only a few may survive uh, so high fecundity high reproductive rate may help in keeping up the uh, survival capacity so uh, even like multiple reproductive organs uh, like high fecundity high reproductive rate it helps to produce large number of individuals and this usually uh, helps in compensating for the high mortality uh, and obviously helps in survival of the species okay another feature which we have uh, found in the case of endoparasites is in polyembryonic and parthenogenesis okay the same single uh, um, embryo it may develop into numerous uh, like single fertilized from a single fertilized egg numerous embryos may develop or numerous individuals may be produced and parthenogenesis even without fertilizing uh, an egg may develop into a complete individual okay parthenogenesis these two actually helps in uh, increasing the number of individuals or multiplication of individuals and thus it helps in keeping up the um, survival of the species right so uh, um, then like um, polyembryonic parthenogenesis hermaphroditism all those are certain adaptive features with respect to reproductive capacity that can equip the parasite to lead a parasitic mode of life okay then you can we can also find certain forms of periodicities this is with respect yeah uh, even endoparasites and ectoparasites we can see they uh, show certain uh, periodicities right that is you may have find that uh, um, the plasmodium um, the parasite and anopheles mosquito they do have a same synchronized periodicity in the sense anopheles uh, like uh, they usually bite in the night and at that time the these uh, parasites uh, come to uh, to the body surface so when the anopheles mosquito take the uh, blood bite or blood food feed so these um, plasmodium can also get on to the uh, mosquito right to complete its life cycle so that kind of a synchronized periodicity is found so various forms of periodicities can be found like diurnal nocturnal uh, seasonal and these are usually synchronized with the activities and habits of the host or the carrier or the vectors okay for example the nocturnal periodicity of the filarial worm microfilarial state corresponds to the nocturnal habit of the culex mosquito and the migration of human pinworm uh, it is also sleep related so this kind of a uh, periodicity can also be found uh, with respect to the parasites okay uh, then um, regarding the dispersal so how the uh, parasite get dispersed um, like uh, this one from one to the other host right so dispersal of parasites is possible by producing various uh, what you call stages like cyst and larvae so the larvae may be mobile Uh, and there may be cyst when uh, it, uh, in the form of cyst the uh, particular uh, organism uh, and the cyst stage can be uh, can survive in the external harsh environment for a longer period of time till the organism finds a host a favorable host 
okay, that can disposal can be. For example, Mirasidim larva, it facilitates easy disposal of the organism of the parasite. Okay. So these kinds of parasitic adaptations can be found in uh, various organisms. All these may be in the same organism, but these kinds of uh, um, like uh, features help in the parasitic mode of. Okay, so far uh, so we, ha we have been uh, looking into parasites, the different kinds of parasites and uh, parasitic adaptations. Uh, now, host. Okay, we, uh, what is host actually? Host is the organism upon which the parasite uh, lives, isn't it? It could be like a uh, uh, host can be dependent upon, mainly uh, host is usually dependent upon by the parasite for their food, for their metabolic uh, requirements. Okay, now what are the different kinds of hosts? Uh, the four different kinds of uh, hosts uh, based upon uh, the role in harboring the parasite, uh, how the um, like the facilities uh, the host provides for their reproduction, and uh, the like uh, the role in their transmission, etc. Based on these factors, the uh, hosts can be divided into four: uh, definitive host, intermediate host, paratenic host, and reservoir host. Actually, all these are familiar. You are familiar with uh, only the terms you need to learn. Okay, definitive host is otherwise known as the primary host. Intermediate host is otherwise known as the secondary host. Okay, now what is primary host? The host in which the um, parasite completes its sexual reproduction, isn't it? Uh, it? It is considered to be the primary host or the definitive host. So it is the host where the parasite. Uh, undergoes sexual reproduction and the host the definitive host usually harbors the adult parasite fine now what are the examples um, human is a definitive host for many uh, human parasites for example tinea the state form then uh, you have the uh, what do you call usher area bankruptcy Share area that is elephant uh, worm, uh, elephant diasis, isn't it? Yeah, so all fire area worm, isn't it? So all these do have humans as the definitive host. So all this completes their sexual production phase in humans. But uh, human, in the case of uh, plasmodium, uh, human is an intermediate host. Okay, so who is the uh, definitive host over there? It is female Anopheles mosquito is the definitive host. Okay, passing on to the next one, intermediate host. So it is otherwise known as secondary host. It is this host in which the parasite spends its um, larval uh, life or asexual life. Okay, and as we have seen uh, for the um, malarial uh, plasmodium, female Anopheles is the uh, definitive host, while human is the intermediate host. Okay, and uh, we can see that in the case of Boucher area, um, the human was the definitive host, isn't it? And while Culex is the intermediate host. Okay. Uh, make note of uh, on the examples very clear. I suppose it is clear. Right. Pausing on to the next one, paratinic host. Paratinic host, uh, it is otherwise known as a vector or a carrier host. So now it is clear to you, isn't it? So what is a paratinic host then? It is a host which harbors the parasite and serves as an agent for the transmission of the parasite from one host to the other. Okay, so one primary host to the other, the transmission is taken up by the paratinic host. So, uh, mosquitoes is a uh, paratinic host. Uh, in some cases, even blood sucking flies are a paratinic host so, of human parasites. Listen, so, paratinic host is nothing but the carrier or the victim. Okay. Now, the last one is the reservoir host or it is a reserve. It is a host which uh, first gets infected with a parasite and then serves as a source of infection for other organisms. Okay. Um, I hope it is clear that it is a host which gets the infection first and then what happens is now this host, it acts like a source of infection for other organisms we can have we have an example uh, right now that is um, obviously uh, the uh, coronavirus it passed from uh, like uh, maybe a bat or a or what do you call a civet cat or something like that it is not even completely proven 
from where it has come but from an animal isn't it and it passed into someone in the wuhan area in that uh, like uh, uh, market right it passed on to a human and that human it worked uh, it uh, uh, he the he or she whoever it is acted as a um, agent or source of infection for every other human in the world so reservoir host right um for uh, the exam purpose i'll give you an example like a uh, um dog is supposed to be uh, a reserve host for entamoeba histolytica right um in some parts of the world for example china it is a dog which act as a reserve host uh, there can be monkeys deer etc which act as reserve host for trypanosoma i hope it is clear okay so there are four different kinds of uh, host definitive host or primary host intermediate host or secondary host paratonic host or a carrier or a vector reservoir host or reserve okay so with this we have uh, completed the population ecology so uh, we'll just summarize what we have seen so far we saw population what is population the characteristics of population Uh, we saw the dynamics of population, the uh, population growth, the different population growth curves we have. We saw. Then we passed on to population interactions where um, members of the same species or uh, two different species uh, interact and how the interaction is affected. We saw that there are. Uh, we have discussed about positive population interactions and negative population interactions. We saw the different types and we also uh, went through a few examples. So with this, we have completed the um, unit seven as per your syllabus, and we'll be passing on, passing on to community ecology in the coming sessions. Okay, thank you.